does anybody mind if we get started a few minutes early because it's a short session and it's not like people who came in late will miss the whole wind up? So, all right. So this session is called Ask the Architects. I'm the only architect up here, so we're going to rename it Agile style to Ask the Architect. And I have no prepared material, so everything's fair game. Uh, Java past, present, future. I, you, very often I find the most interesting questions are the why questions, not the what questions. So this is your opportunity to ask why did you, why didn't you, etc. So first question. Oh, yes, a microphone will come to you. Thanks. Uh, so there was today the presentation by Martin Thompson. Oh, yeah. Uh, where he <laughs> mentioned about the uh, JDK uh, uh, being perhaps, the libraries being perhaps uh, maybe allocation heavy and so on. Mm -hmm. So is there any work or ideas on that? Um, so that's a big question, uh, right? So the JDK libraries serve a lot of audiences. Um, and you know, so we have a, you know, a range of users, some are more performance sensitive to, the, to others. In general, the library, the core libraries we provide, we're aiming at sort of the middle, right? Um, for people who are doing high frequency trading, who are latency sensitive, uh, these may not be the ideal libraries for you, but it is not necessarily the JDK for high frequency traders, it's the JDK for everybody. So um, there's lots of things that we could do, but in general, um, our focus is on providing something that's useful to a broader spectrum. So that's probably not an area where you would see us investing a lot. I think you, there's, there's other people who are investing in that, uh, and that's their specialty. But um, you know, we're, we're sort of aiming at the, at the middle of the market. Martin, go ahead. Please retort. Not even retort, I actually agree. Uh, to clarify some of my point from earlier, it's not that we should change all the library to suit high frequency trading. I think some of the things are even a little bit error prone. For example, if you want to go from a byte buffer to a string, we have to go through an intermediate step of a byte array. It's to take that step out of it, because then it's actually going to reduce the errors as well as the allocation. And that, that's some of the things that historically, with 20 year old language, that's perfectly normal. It's just how do we get these things prioritized because they actually do hurt yeah. some people and actually hurt the majority as well. Yeah. I would add that uh, we've seen <clears throat> in a lot of cases that there's just frameworks in the uh, JDK that could be just a little bit more memory efficient, but I understand that it's not your focus, it's to provide more functionality and we could provide patches, I guess, for the corrections. Ab absolutely, yep. Question over there. So um, currently in Java, you can define immutable gla classes by using the final keyword, but uh, it is pretty limited and uh, quite cumbersome to use. Are there any plans on making immutable classes more easy to define so that they are truly immutable through the whole class hierarchy and so forth? Yeah, so, so there, there, there's, there's, there's a couple answers to that. First of all, you're absolutely right. You know, um, what, one, one of the things that's surprising is that Java managed to get all the defaults wrong and still be the world's most popular programming language. And one of the defaults that we got wrong was mutable by default. It would have been much better if it was final by default. If I had a time machine and I could go back 20 years, you know, I, 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 would, uh, I would certainly go back with that advice, although I'm not sure it would be listened to. Um, so what are we doing about it? Clearly we can't flip the, the defaults now, the, that, that ship has sailed. Uh, but we're doing a lot of things to encourage immutability uh, in subtle ways. For example, um, you, know, the, uh, you, you can capture immutable or effectively immutable values from, from, uh, from lambdas, but not mutable variables, right? That's one of the things, the little gentle pushes we give. Uh, if you saw the keynote this morning, uh, you know, one, one of the features that we're working on is value types. Value types are immutable, uh, and they're likely to be a lot easier to use, and so that provides yet another gentle push. Um, we're, we'd be interested in doing something to generally make it easier to declare typical immutable data, data holder classes. Um, 
And it's something we're thinking about. Uh, you know, we're, we're waiting for the value type story to play out and then see what makes sense to uh, graft back onto ordinary classes. So it's definitely something that we think is important. It's definitely something we want to encourage. Um, and you know, right now, it's just way too much work to write a simple class that has no semantic content other than int x, int y. And that's definitely something that we are interested in addressing. But there's also a lot of things going on, so. Hey, um, I saw the keynote in the morning, and you were explaining that you dedicate a lot of time to take out the new features, because there, there is a lot of people asking for new things in Java. And my question would be, uh, I personally, I've seen now lots of uh, languages running in, on the virtual machine, JRuby, Groovy, Scala. So everyone is trying to beat Java in some way, gain popularity, and, and yeah. So uh, my question is, do you, as Java uh, architect, look at other languages? Do you get, do you get some inspiration or, or do you personally like another language that you think is worth to look at? Yeah, okay, so that, that, that's a great question. So um, yes, of course, we're looking at what's going on in Scala, in Clojure, in C Sharp, uh, which is not a JVM language, but a spiritually similar language to Java. And we're looking at what works there and what doesn't work there. Um, and we certainly get feature ideas and we get anti-feature ideas from, uh, you know, from the other communities. And so, um, you know, for example, Scala is a great programming language laboratory. You know, they, they've made the deliberate choice to move faster at the risk of being less stable. And that's an excellent choice, you know, for, the, the, you know, for, 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 for them. And it benefits us as well because we get to see what works and we get to see what doesn't work. And then, you know, the things that work, you know, we can pull those in, and that's great. Um, and the things that, you know, that are, uh, it, it, the things that are mistakes, it's great to see other people making your mistakes so you don't have to. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time looking at what other languages are doing uh, because there's no, you know, uh, there's no limit to where good ideas can come from. Um, it, it's, uh, I'm really impressed, by the way, with the work that the C-sharp guys are doing. Uh, they, they have managed to continually evolve the language both in expressivity and also in ease of use. They're doing some really nice work there. Uh, you know, so they, even though they're you know, not even running on the JVM, there's plenty to learn from, from there. Hey, Java has default constructor. So similarly, why don't we have uh, default getters and setters for the properties? So this is a this is sort of a sad story, right? So um, properties has been kind of a, a subject that won't go away for many years, right? It's it's one, it's one of those things that everybody asks for, and the problem is while most developers are agreed on the idea that they want properties. Uh, properties actually describes many possible and mutually inconsistent language features. And when you dig a little bit deeper, what you find is there's, let's call them properties A, properties B, properties C, um, each of which would be recognizable as properties, but you can't do them all. And when you look at the people who are in favor of, a of adding properties to the language, they're in fact fragmented into these different camps. And the only thing worse than not at doing properties to one of these proponents is doing one of the other kinds of properties. And in fact, in the project coin uh, process, which we ran during uh, Java 7, where uh, language features were proposed by the community, the most bitter and nasty arguments were the ones between proponents of different properties proposals. Um, so you know, if we came out and said, we're doing properties and this is what it looks like, Three quarters of the people who want properties would say, oh, you idiots, how can you like run all the way up to the goal line and then run in the other direction and score in the opposite goal, right? So, um, and properties are largely, they really shouldn't be a language feature at all, right? Properties are a library writing convention. Um, I think it's kind of a stupid convention and it's one that we got stuck with many, many years ago before we knew any better. Um, so, I, I, I think it's one of those things where we could do a lot of work, uh, we could you know, make a lot of people unhappy that we did the wrong thing, we would have some significant uh, compatibility issues in migrating existing classes to supporting properties, and we would not have really moved 
the move things forward very much. And so, I, I you know, for for example, I think we were much better off focusing on lambda expressions in eight than properties, even though properties was the single most demanded thing, uh, you know, in terms of you know polls of like what feature do you want to see added to Java. So I, I, I think it's something that if we had done it from day one, it would have been fine. I kind of think that ship has sailed a little bit. And as this questioner you know, over, over here pointed out, really you want to be using immutable uh, domain objects anyway. Immutable domain objects don't need setters, and they don't even need getters because you can expose public fields because they're immutable. So I think it may be a convention whose time has passed. Question over here. I have a question about uh, exceptions and checked exceptions versus, versus runtime. Uh, and you're clever guys, so I just want to hear your reasoning about why we have these two types. Yeah, so um, that, that's, that's a really fair question. So error handling has been one of the most persistent problems in programming language design for the history of programming languages. Um, you know, if you look at why we did checked exceptions in Java, um, you know, the argument was a pretty rational one, which is looking at what was happening in other languages, especially C, saying, well, if you use a return value to express uh, an error condition, it will be universally ignored. And checked exceptions are harder to ignore. And that's true. And if you look at, um, at the time, uh, exceptions in C++, where they were all unchecked, it was a pervasive problem that no library ever documented what exceptions were thrown. And so you either had to wrap every single call to another library with, with try-catch, which sucks, or you had to engage in an archaeology expedition to figure out what exceptions were actually thrown, and that sucks. So looking at what had been tried before and didn't work, checked exceptions were a fairly sensible response to that. Now, a lot of people hate checked exceptions, and I, I, I think the reason people hate checked exceptions is not that they're inherently evil, but they were used pretty poorly in the early Java language, uh, early Java libraries design. Um, so there are a lot of things that throw a check exception for which no possible reasonable error recovery, you know, um, you know, is is uh, is evident. Like, why does input stream dot close throw a check exception? What could you possibly do in response? Close it again, see if it like you know takes it this time. So you know that that's that's not the sort of you know so that's not the sort of thing I think that checked exceptions were meant for, but we didn't know any better. We designed a lot of libraries you know using this new tool, and it took a while to uh, come up with the right set of uh, guidelines about when something should be checked or unchecked. So I think if we had a little bit better taste in the way exceptions were used in libraries, I think checked exceptions would be a little bit less of a of a whipping boy. Um, languages designed since Java now are using the same, well, the other things didn't work, so let's try something different, right? You know, so Go returns a tuple of an error value and a return value. And if you read like the descriptive text about why they do that, it is almost word for word identical to what Java used 20 years ago to justify why we were doing tech exceptions. And the reality is we are all so damn lazy that we can't think about error handling right, and we need someone to like hit us over the head until we deal with it, because otherwise we'll ignore it. And programmers will move heaven and earth to ignore our error codes. So I, I think the hope is that there somehow might be an unintrusive way to do error handling, and I just don't think there is. And I think that's why people want to wish checked exceptions away. So yes, they're annoying. <laughs> Um, but I think the annoyance more comes from being misused uh, than being fundamentally flawed. And at this point, I think changing it would, the cure would be worse than the disease. But it's a okay. fair question. Three minutes, still counting. Okay, we got a question over here. Oh, question over there first. He beat you to it. Um, yeah, so I was wondering how you look at aspect-oriented programming these days. That was very popular, at, you know, at the early 2000s when Spring, the Spring framework first came about, but never made its way into the, uh, 
into the JDK. That's yeah, and, and, and it never really made its way into any mainstream programming language. So, you know, if, if you look at the, um, you know, Sun, um, you know, had a, uh, you know, uh, a, bu a bug parade, top 10 list of RFEs for Java that it, um, that it maintained for a long time. And aspect-oriented programming, you know, was always like one of the top 10 things on the list. Basically, it was, it was one of the top 10 at the time we stopped voting for things, right? So it stayed there for a long time. Uh, but the reality is, it didn't live up to the promise. And oh my god, am I glad that we didn't destroy the language to add this feature, because we'd still be dealing with it. And the stuff that I was talking about in my keynote today, about you know, having to be compatible with and interact with every feature that's been added in the past, this is a feature that would interact with everything. So you know th this is this is a situation where a little bit of conservatism saves you from you know years and years of pain. Um, I I think it has been reasonably successful in the context of you know um, you know uh, of frameworks like Spring, but I think as a language feature it would have been a disaster, and I'm really glad that we uh, we didn't do it. Okay, we have two questions left and two minutes left. Hi. Uh, on the topic of checked exceptions, yeah. I think I embrace them because uh, they kind of come away, tell you to, this is something that went wrong, it's something you need to care about. Yeah. But when using them in the context of streams, you try to s stay within that paradigm and do checked exceptions, uh, it kind of breaks down. You have to wrap your types in something. I, I, yeah. And, and um, you know, so, so that, that question came up in an earlier session as well. And, and the way I look at that is, you know, because we, we discussed that quite extensively in the, um, in the JSR 335 expert group. And our conclusion was, it doesn't actually break down because you can always put a try catch in your lambda. What, what, what happens there is, you know, you're, you've kind of gotten spoiled by your lambdas being this big, and now you have one that's this big, and you feel like, oh, I got cheated. But you can express exactly what you mean with try catch. Um, we looked at a number of uh, alternatives to try to provide exception transparency, um, and none of them really worked very well. Uh, we evaluated a number of different options. Um, I think at least six or seven different schemes for handling exceptions, and they were all terrible. Um, and and so we concluded that yes, every once in a while you'll build a stream pipeline with an IO-based source, and you'll have to deal with some checked exceptions. But the majority of stream pipelines just deal with data. They, their sources are collections, and you're, not, you know, and, you're, and you're not doing IO, which is really the primary source of checked exceptions in that situation. And so we concluded it really wasn't worth doing something special. You know, this was just an example of an ordinary Java library, and you know, these are the kind of things that you have to deal with in, you know, when, you're in, when you're connecting two libraries together. Okay, and now the final question. Hi, thank you for your wait. Awesome job on that. Um, so I was missing one thing in the stream API, uh, sort of the opposite of flat mapping. Flat mapping, you have one element, you make it into a stream of several elements. I'm sort of looking for the opposite, like I, I want to group adjacent elements into one element. Uh, my use case was I was reading logs, uh, log lines of logs from uh, the network and trying to group them into log records. And, this, and I had to drop out of the stream API to use iterator. What were you thinking about that? So, so um, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to want to do. Um, and we looked into use cases like that. And, and the reality when designing a library like Streams is you can't put everything in it, uh, both because it would take forever to, to build, but it would also uh, confuse people if you had 4,000 methods on the Stream API. And so at some point you have to draw the line of say, you know, yes, this is a legitimate use case, but it's a minority use case. And maybe it's on, on the wrong side of the line. So there's, there's nothing wrong with it. Totally reasonable thing to want to do. Um, a lot of people do, do stuff like that, but um, it just didn't make the cut. OK, time flies when having fun. Please All continue right. discussion outside, but we have to finish now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.